Um, so welcome everyone. We're happy that you can join us today. Um, spending your afternoon in front of a computer screen instead of being outside. We're not sure where you are right now, but it's a gorgeous afternoon here in Toronto. Uh, my name is Anik Glode and I'm the curator of the Varley Art Gallery of Markham. Uh, beside me, well, on my screen to my right, uh, is Yan Wu, the public art curator at the city of Markham. Um, and so uh, with um, uh, Markham Public Art, uh, the Varley Art Gallery are the producers behind the digital project online. So before we get um, to today's event, um, and I uh, let Yan introduce you to the project, um, I know that we're all connected um, from our various locations uh, across Canada, maybe across the world, who knows. Um, I would still like to acknowledge that the Varley Art Gallery of Markham is situated on the traditional territories of Indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe. We also recognize the enduring presence of Indigenous peoples on this land, and in particular, the First Nation community in closest proximity to the gallery in York region, the Chippewas of Georgina Island. Specifically, this statement means to us that the gallery is committed to learning the history of this land by doing our own research, by listening, and by collaborating. So online is a joint initiative between Markham Public Art and the Varley Art Gallery of Markham. It delves into the potential of public art production and social engagement in the digital sphere. Driving it is the central question. Can this time of uncertainty be productive? Can it be an opportunity for us to pause and reflect, to reshape and imagine new public spatial relationships, whether built or natural, virtual or physical? Arising directly from the City Council approved Mar Markham Public Art Master Plan 2020-2024, online explores the multiple factors that steer the making of public art, how artworks find their sites and become public. Unfolding over the summer of 2020, online has two parts, a practical webinar series on public art titled Homework, which is co-produced with public art consul consulting firm Art Plus Public Unlimited, and an online competition for speculative public art proposal titled Delimit. The entire initiative is hosted on and distributed by a publicly available network of digital platforms. On behalf of the Varley Art Gallery, I would like to thank the Ontario Arts Council and the Varley Mackay Art Foundation of Markham for their ongoing support. And with that, I pass it on to Yan. Hey. And uh, just give me a second. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Thanks, Nick. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. So speaking of uh, today's event, it actually arises from a series of uh, coincidences. And when Markham City Council formally approved the master plan, and Nick mentioned earlier, and its implementation plan earlier this year, I was planning a three-day international public art summit for June with public art consultant Rebecca Carbon. I think Rebecca is here. Hi. And to be more precise, the summit was supposed to take place last week. And one anchoring element of this summit was a keynote lecture by Ken Long. And we were thrilled when Ken first accepted our invitation. Actually, it was around the time when his recent book, Everything is Relevant, was published. And we thought the social context of Markham and its current development in public art could provide a perfect backdrop to introduce Ken's artwork, especially those ones cited in the public realm and his writings. Then a few weeks later, COVID-19 happened, like everything else and everyone else. We had to postpone the summit to the fall and exploring the ways to move it online. Today's event is actually part of these ongoing explorations. At one point, when I was preparing for D-Limits and the online public art competition based on actual physical sites in Markham, I post on Instagram and Facebook looking for um, a Google Map super user to help me. <laughs> and that's how Colin Miner and I were connected. And out of uh, generosity, um, Colin showed me the issue of Maury they did on Ken Lam's work and explained to me how virtual map played a role in his research. I thought to myself, this must be destiny. Thanks, Colin, for not only agreeing to reproduce this tutorial, but also expanding a simple idea into such a rich experience we're about to enter. 
and thank you for your meticulous planning and hard work. And uh, we are going to post Colin's bio in the chat box. You can read it later. So I'm not going to repeat it here. And just one more note, we are not going to take questions during Colin's uh, presentation. After that, there will be a Q&A period. And uh, thanks in advance for your patience. And now um, here comes uh, Colin. <laughs> Uh, hi, everybody. Can you hear me, Anne? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome. Um, it'll be about a 40 minute, 40 minute plus presentation. Um, yeah, and I'll give details as I go. As a first generation Canadian, I want to acknowledge my place of birth as the traditional territory of the Mi'kmaq. This territory is covered by the treaties of the peace and friendship first signed with the British Crown in 1726. The treaties did not negotiate surrender of lands and resources, but instead recognized Mi'kmaq title. Articulating this reference has personal significance in relation to my experience with an introduction to a Mi'kmaq community on the outskirts of Halifax at a young age. This visit was facilitated by, the, by an alternative elementary school run by Dalhousie University and offered an early appreciation and respect for a diversity of culture, history, perspectives, and contexts of place. I would like to thank the Mi'kmaq, my parents, and all the various caretakers throughout my life for their generosity and sharing the value of education, questioning, and empathy. This is also an opportunity to acknowledge the difficult times we are in and the importance of being accountable in our methodologies and practices. Words are not enough, especially when the issues permeate and in many ways compose the frameworks for systems on which our lives and realities are so firmly rooted and developed. <clears throat> As a white cis male, it is my responsibility to clearly identify white supremacy as a spectrum and the significant advantages the system has afforded both myself and a disproportionate representation of white men across a much larger and greatly more complex public. White people tend to look at racism within the context of their lifetime. This is a privilege which negates the vast problematic histories on which we live and how our lives are founded. At issue are social and power constructs tied to systematic methods of oppression and justice. These times require not only allies, but loving people, people coming to terms with realities they hadn't imagined. These times require decisive work for our present and future generations. Thank you for affording me the opportunity to speak, and I look forward to listening to and working with you in the future. Moray is an artist publication established by Liza Yurek, Ella Don McGough, and Colin Minor in 2012 that focuses on artistic practice through the production of texts, interviews, images, and collaborative projects. The most recent publication project titled And Space Across Time from 2019 considered the practice of Ken Lum, specifically focusing on a selection of his public artworks. For this project, Mei Chu wrote a fantastic text titled Landscape Plus Language Plus Labor plus love. Um, Ella Don facilitated an interview text with images by Ken Lam from his 2019 visits with us in Tuarli, Beijing. Uh, apologies, the image there went missing. You could see an image there from the issue. Liza Yurek developed a downloadable font in relation to text sourced from past Ken Lum works. And I have a short text plus images made from site visits in person and digitally 
via street view over a four year period, which we will see later. Moray's Catwalk is a supplemental Moray project existing both as an Instagram account feed and a rooftop space for presentation of projects. Website forthcoming. Moray's Catwalk developed from a focus on walking and a slowing down while being present. This was a coping strategy I adapted during my doctoral work and has become an increasingly significant part of my research practice as developed during a three month residency in a remote and isolated selection of the Amazon rainforest and following a significant cushion sustained in a motor vehicle accident that left me cognitively impaired for a number of years. I wanted to share a few sources uh, that I came across early on in developing some of this methodology related to Moray's catwalk. Uh, the first is a video. Uh, Brigadier Satria Sukuya, Indonesia, from 2018. The second uh, reference is from Istanbul, Turkey, and Tambili, the street cat, who became kind of a local figure of the area that people would visit. And upon his uh, decease, uh, the town came together uh, uh, and made a, a monument for the cat. Um, I thought these were kind of touching engagements uh, with different subjectivities in different places, looking at different qualities of relations and power dynamics. I'm now going to share a short text I wrote that I feel is intriguing to revisit in relation to reconsidering systems, methodologies, and practices in our current times in the larger public artwork programming that this presentation is a part of. Moray offers no knowing, rather as an effect, it questions vision. In scanning the history of Moray alongside methods to work around and unfurl it, a pattern comprised of avoidance is illuminated when viewed in duration, what comes into focus is an overlapping of materiality and immateriality. Footnote number one, quote, words put the matter in a new light. The moiré effect was ultimately a kind of graphic unconscious, a basic condition of blur out of which temporary effects of sharpness were occasionally won. End quote, Lytle Shaw, the moiré effect from 2012. A shifting quality of relations is present, presenting itself, that is. Emerging, a paradox takes shape in which not looking is less confusing than beholding. To realize the effect, it becomes a requisite to see at angle, a ride to the subject light seeks to represent. Footnote two, quote, light can in fact only give way to an image when its path is impeded when it is turned away from its course, end quote. Eduardo Cadava from Words of Light, Theses on the Photography of History from 1997. Representing Moiré can be conceived through a visualization process in which the physicality of material is transfigured into the immateriality of the imagistic. 
This enhanced visibility is accrued in the crossing of singular paths to make patterns. And then again, in the crossing of each pattern that composes the effect so tightly it becomes Im impermeable to the eye. Footnote three, quote, I decompose, enlarge, and so to speak, I retired in order to have time to know at last, end quote. From Roland Barthes, Camera Lucida, 1980. Slipping, skewing, and swaying, the friction between patterns adjusts slightly and erratically to reveal a process of recomposing, decomposing. What does the composition know? Footnote four, quote, what is to be understood by composition? Two things which compose together. First, separated by an insuperable limit, the two concepts exchange compromises. They compose together, the one with the other. This concept of the photograph photographs all conceptual oppositions. It traces a relationship of haunting, which perhaps is constitutive of all logics." End quote. Jacques Derrida, from the deaths of Roland Barthes, 1981. Like a compressed, fragmented, crystalline form, the spaces between surfaces are difficult to grasp, not for lack of contrast, but the inverse, a collapse of contrast. Whereas patterns behind offer ground and patterns in front figure, Moiré is composed within an interstitial space between surfaces of contact. When viewing this middle terrain, we can start to conceive a veiled occultism. Footnote five, quote, when the world in itself becomes occulted or hidden, a strange and paradoxical movement takes place whereby the world in itself presents itself to us, but without ever becoming fully accessible or completely knowable, end quote by Eugene Thacker from In the Dust of This Planet, 2011. However, the opacity of these layers and their subsequent depth of, of obscurity are not complete. If they were, there would be nothing to see. Frustratingly, Moiré is captivating in its complexity, in its dance that threatens reason and in its existence outside of the presently predictable. Footnote six, quote, we might pin down a buckyball's location by observing it, but in between our observations, it takes all paths. No matter how thorough our observation of the present, the unobserved past, like the future, is indefinite and exists only as a spectrum of possibilities. By Stephen Hawking and Leonard Mladenov from The Grand Design, 2010. The abstract space of dull blurry shade and sharp points of light oscillating within the effect wait for the curious. With eyes captivated, awareness seeks out qualities of relation that offer form to the space time between the layered depths of grounds and figures. The following is an approximate 25 minute composition conceived as a Moray project in conversation with the Ken Lum issue. What you will see is silent video that wanders around five sites of Ken Lum's work, each of which is accompanied by a corresponding audio track 
that was made over the last few days by people in the cities at the sites. Further contacts and details will be provided afterwards. You may want to raise or lower your sound level, but note that there is a mix of louder and more subtle sounds at various points. The video movements may not be very smooth. Apologies for that. <laughs> and if you feel uncomfortable at any point, I encourage you to close your eyes and consider the audio aspect more closely. some of the protests and some of the, uh, the, the media um, photographs and so forth of some of these, these, uh, these protests, uh, that they are wearing masks. And I think that that's a testament to, to them understanding the, the uh, gravity of the situation, uh, but also wanting to exercise their First Amendment rights uh, and to take, you know, again, for this to happen at the same time, inconvenient uh, at best, but, uh, but again, I think this is too important of an issue uh, to let go.
several years, I worked for a community arts organization and was responsible for steering public art projects, a couple of murals come to mind, and maintenance is always a thing that when you consider the investment in public art, you don't necessarily consider the, the long tail investment. A few years back, I remember revisiting a mural that I was a part of near Yorkdale. It was a mural that was working with youth in Lawrence Heights, Neptune, and it was in such disarray. Another mural that I wasn't directly part of, but the artist I worked with was, and it was the same organization. You know, it's, it's different. And so it's telling, I suppose, or not, that in looking at a work like this, by an artist like Ken Lum, I mean, what does the maintenance look like right now, or lack thereof? There's some garbage in the, I guess, expanse between the two figures. There's weeds, tall grass in between, uh, I guess, maybe some flowering flowers are gonna bloom later this season. It's an area that I'm sure residents shoppers from the Canadian uh, Tire pass by and maybe they don't really look at these details. These are kind of the details that when you are thinking of the life cycle of a work, you think about the care and consideration of it. about care and consideration for public art objects. What does care and consideration look like for human beings, interspecies, in your world building?
I don't know if you can hear uh, the protests. I don't know if you can call it protests. It's a gathering right now. Uh, but this woman is asking us to sing happy birthday to Donald Trump. that unfortunate thing of I can't make that shit up. Um, yesterday, there were two protests here, actually, one for in support of the family of Chantelle Moore, um, an indigenous woman who was shot out in New Brunswick by the police during a wellness check. Uh, it actually accidentally crossed over with the protests in support of Hong Kong. Uh, the protesters for Hong Kong actually closed up and gave room for the family yesterday, so not every day here is ugly. Um, so I came here to talk about the Ken Lum pieces, and honestly, I hadn't really noticed them until a couple weeks ago when I came up for the Black Lives Matter rally, and I was like, oh, those are new. Um, they've actually been there since 2001. Um, they're interesting. Oh, that's too wild. I just walked by my landlord. <laughs> but yeah, so the boats, uh, I noticed they're painted black, red, white, and yellow. And I always kind of uh, feel my whole body clench when I see that, because I'm never sure if it's an indigenous artist doing it. And then I always have like mixed feelings, because like how much of that feeling do I really get to own as a nation who, to my knowledge, doesn't really use the medicine wheel. Um, so I have questions. I looked it up. There's like a very sparse collection of information about it online, uh, even on Ken Lum's site. Uh, I'm not mad about the work. I mean, if it was intentional to use medicine color wheel colors, that's one thing. Um, arguing whether or not this is an area that needs healing is another. Um, people bring a lot of fear, anger, grief here, um, and ugliness. Uh, so I can't discount the value of putting that there. Oh man, this whole thing is just like blocked off. I don't know how to get to the front of the gallery. Um, That was really upsetting walking by those other, that other group. Yesterday I was out at Namgans, the tent city encampment down in Crab Park, which is an indigenous led encampment for homeless people. Um, and I think the question I have about this work in general, and most work in general, is just. Um, what would it look like if there were indigenous people who hadn't been colonized, who could enact their own governance? And I wonder what the Squamish, Musqueam, and tsleil peoples would have done if uh, they were in full control of their territories and were receiving these migrant ships or receiving, receiving the Komagata Maru. Um, my hope is always that you find a way to make space and accept people um, and receive them as they come. But I think in contrast to singing happy birthday to Mr. Trump over there, you can understand how that feeling gets complicated. And maybe, maybe an indigenous group of people wouldn't welcome people who arrived. I hope if they saw that they were in need that they would.
Okay. Thanks for sharing that with me. While I offer contacts and details on the project we just experienced, I will show images from the Moray issue that corresponded to the relevant sites of work by Ken Lum. In order of presentation, we have uh, the first audio by Mei Chu in Montreal at the site of the No Longer There, There Is No Place Like Home, 2001. 1543 Rue Jean Mans at the intersection of Rue Belmore and Mayer Street. Wrong button there. Following that, we had audio by Ria McNamara in Toronto at the site of Across Time and Space, Two Children of Toronto Meet in 2013. Intersection unnamed laneway at 542 Bay Street. We then had audio by Tiziana Lamilia in Vancouver at the site of What an idiot, what an idiot you are, what an utterly useless idiot you are. And next to that, the work, You So Smart. You make me proud, you're so smart. I so proud, you so smart. From 2006, at the intersection of Thornton Street and Malkin Avenue. We then had audio work by Wes Harmon at the site of Four Boats Stranded, red and yellow, black and white, from 2000. At 750 Hornby Street, the four corners of the Vancouver Art Gallery. We then had audio with Patrick Cruz, also under there, Vancouver especially, a Vancouver special scaled to its property value in 1973, and increased by eightfold which is located at 71 Union Street, approximately the intersection of Union Street and Gore Avenue. I'm very grateful and appreciative of the time that May, Rhea, Tiziana, Wes, and Patrick offered to, to engage this project. For me, the sites and engagement are important in the real world as much as a virtual world, in addition to the historical and contemporary contexts. I wanted to facilitate the consideration for a diversity of voices, which I greatly appreciate as a key aspect in the work of Ken Lum. The speaking fee offered to me for this event was redistributed towards the people that did the audio visiting work. This project as recording will be available at a later date and will offer full textual references and credit. credits. Before my, base, before, my, <laughs> sorry. before my voice fades, I would like to revisit Ken Lum's 2006 essay, Something's Missing. This text continues to stick with me for personal and professional reasons. I would like to share a passage that I believe offers even further insight when spoken in the light of our current conditions. To quote, we like to believe that art operates in a space separate from political economy. We even like to believe that the separation is necessary in order to maintain a critical distance from the social order. There is some validity to the separation and that critical distance from one's own presuppositions can allow for different epistemic uh, perspectives. But I'm wary of the ways in which the separation can be used in the service of a neo-colonialist logic. Uh, that text is included in Ken's recent book, Everything is Relevant. Thank you very much for your time uh, and attending. Okay, Jan.
Okay, so we can come back and uh, I'm going to invite Anik back and also our project coordinator, Lucia. Um, I just have to find, where are you? <laughs> okay. And uh, now it's uh, Q&A. If anybody you have uh, questions and um, I think you can either type in chat, but uh, it will be great if you actually type in the Q&A box, if you see it at the bottom of your screen. And thanks, Colin. This is wonderful. And uh, oh. I really enjoy the tour, the, the visual and uh, um, the audio. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I should thank all the people involved, especially there's a lot going on these days, um, especially Wes was involved in uh, some political actions during this time, and I think is currently doing that. So, so it's re uh, yeah, really amazing that these people shared their time with us. Okay. Hello. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, I guess, um, actually, I'm really curious to hear as uh, Ken, are you still here? I really would like to hear what you think about it and uh, how you think about the tour. It's okay, I allow you to talk and uh, you can tell us. Okay. I wonder, okay, cool. Okay, I think I just uh, allow you to talk. Okay. Um, right. Yes. First, is that, is that part of the design, uh, uh, the Mori pattern over Colin? Because I can barely see him. Yeah. Yeah. It's part <laughs> of that. Part of the design. Okay. I think it's over designed. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, prefer, I prefer lots, to see lots it. of opinions out there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think the experience of it, obviously, in a Zoom format, isn't isn't maybe ideal. But I certainly think, you know, alone late at night. You have your headsets on, maybe with a tablet, and and you have the sound reverberating uh, in your ears, right? Then then things start ricocheting as a kind of constellation of um, I don't know of a uh, of uh, just a, a melange of moments and and thoughts, right? I think I, I like the structure of it because I think the structure. Um, encapsulates to a very uh, fidel degree the way we experience or, or the way we try to come to terms with experience um, as it as it tries to become take the form of memory right or as, as it takes the form of of um, of, uh, of insight or something right and it's often a bit clashing and uh, it, it unclear and uh, and uh, in coate even Right, and uh, but yet that's the that's that's the environment. That's the environment that's constituted by all, uh, uh, and what why it makes why the social environment so so um, agonistic in, in character. Right, so I I, I, I like the um, I like the uh, I liked it. That's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> I do think you know I, I kept imagining if I was just lying in bed at night on my own or in my office in front of the uh, desktop, right, and it became very erratic and very or something. Then uh, it would be really, really quite something. You know, it'd be almost druggy, but I mean that in a good way. <laughs> yeah, I agree. It's. Uh, I think maybe we should edit it, that part of the video and uh, the recording as an individual and independent piece. Mm -hmm. I think that would be nice. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's part of the idea, is to have that video and audio in a, a clear format available through the Moray website. Um, yeah, like a high-res kind of thing so people could listen and revisit to it. I also really want to make the full credits of all the people who were involved in the production. So I, I think that's a, a, an appropriate format to do that as well. I especially like the, uh, uh, the person who was commenting on the Four Boats Stranded. Mm -hmm. Because yeah, that's Wes, Wes Harmon. Yeah. Wes Harmon. It was very, yeah. um, I wouldn't say it was contesting, but it was, you know, it wasn't, um, it, it, un, it unveils the work even further, right? In terms of maybe its limits even, and also in terms of its, um, uh, you know, uh, it reveals different, uh, you know, the, the challenges that comes with, with uh, opening up perspectives. Right, different readings, especially a reading that's not as uh, that's marginalized. Let's say. 
Mm -hmm. So I really appreciated that. Yeah, yeah, I, try, I tried to yeah think through, I mean, just different people and uh, based on the timelines and stuff to kind of, to kind of access the diversity of people um, that, that might have various things to offer. Yeah, and I, I just one final thing, I don't want to hog it, but it, uh, I always saw my, uh, the, you know, it became a collective, it became, became a kind of inventory of, of public work that, uh, for Vancouver, right? It, was, it wasn't something that was um, planned in advance. I, you know, I, I won this competition and then someone else asked me for, to do a project there and then I won another one and then uh, someone else asked me to do another project there and so over uh, many years, I, you know, the result was a kind of landscape uh, in the lower mainland of British Columbia that was dotted with several uh, works of mine, right? But, uh, but it wasn't something that I had planned in advance, but now that it is there, I really do see it as a, as a kind of theory of, um, of the lower mainland, of the history of it, of the province of it, of the, you know, of the marginalized voice of the challenges that, uh, of the histories ignored of the challenges that confront the city today and, and by extension of, um, of Canada. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah, really, really appreciate your attendance, Ken, and, yeah. and your generosity of working uh, with me and with Mari on this project. Uh, yeah, uh, over 20 years, I guess. <laughs> well, um, um, Colin was a student uh, of mine when I was at UBC, so, and uh, I see Wanda Weckler, and I think maybe yeah. Romanovsky's here, and they're, they're students too. We have some questions going. I think we were talking about the Vancouver piece and uh, I'm just wondering, cause it's from anonymous attendee and uh, uh, asks, asking uh, would Colin give us more details on the issues surrounding the downtown Vancouver work with the boats. And uh, I just wonder if this person can let me know, let us know if uh, the conversation just um, happened between Colin and Ken answer their question or you would like to have more information. Yeah, I think Ken did a good job of addressing some of that, and I certainly want, want to speak for Wes as well. Um, so, so that's, yeah, I feel like that, that's kind of been addressed to, to, to some extent in right. the capacity of this Q&A. And I think uh, then the next question is uh, from uh, Michelle Gay. If I pronounce anybody's name wrong, please forgive me, and uh, I just apologize in advance. Uh, so she's saying not so, uh, it's not so much a question, but I, I'm really intrigued by Colin's journey from personal bile to the metaphor of what Amori is, keeping this texture as we travel with Colin slowly through Ken's work. Um, quite mesmerizing. I like the timing a lot. And the uh, next one, I think it's a question from Ron Wild. Oh, I will Maybe if I could just jump in. Yeah, for, for me, a practice is ongoing. So for me, that, that's part of the power of a practice. And same with methodologies, is they allow for adaptations, um, you know, di different perspectives and growths of individuals and communities, contexts. So, so there's, I think practices are quite powerful things to consider um, along with works and, and things like this. So, so there's definitely aspects of time and, and, and space and uh, yeah so uh, thank you for the comment okay and uh and nick do you want to read the next question um sure so going back uh ron wild is asking uh going back to the piece at the the vancouver art gallery if ken can comment on the use of the indigenous color palette with the boats am i still muted you know, you are talking, you're not muted. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, good thing I wasn't laughing. <laughs> well, the, no, the color palettes actually um, come from the uh, uh, Christian ch children's song, um, God Loves All the Children of the World, Red and Yellow, Black and White. We're all God's children in his sight. So it's, um, it's actually a quotation from that song, right? It's because I wanted the, I'm not Christian, but I wanted the work to, first of all, the Vancouver Art Gallery gave me a very modest directive. Can, uh, this is in, in advent, uh, advent of the uh, 2000 um, arriving. And the directive was to make a work about the millennium and f 
for the region of Vancouver, which is a pretty big, <laughs> big subject <laughs> to deal with. And so um, I, I, I thought, well, what would be uh, signifiers? Uh, it would, they would be epochal. And so I thought boats arriving could represent kind of epochal changes. I wasn't trying to say that each epochal change was uh, a, prog a progress or a step up from the previous one. I was just saying it was the marker. So you could say when uh, contact arrived, that was a, as, a, as emblematized by Captain Vancouver's boat, that was, that was a marker. The Komagata Maru where, you know, Canada was no longer just a, it was never was, but it, it was no longer, uh, let's just say the, 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 the British population that was ruling Canada was, was suddenly being challenged in terms of its, uh, in terms of its uh, rule. And so that was marked uh, by the Kumagata Maru. And then the last one was a, a Fujian refugee boat um, of, of would-be illegal immigrants from Fujian province in, in, in China that made the news, right? They were kind of unceremoniously dumped on the rocks off uh, Haida Gwaii. And so, the, I, I, and the one, what's the one thing that tethers the whole thing um, in terms of history, right? Um, uh, of this whole um, millennium, you might say, um, uh, it, it is basically um, uh, it is basically the the, the uh, uh, sorry, I'm just losing my thought. The the Christian ethos, right? So you know, I'm not Christian, right? I have I have a lot of problems with <laughs> with it. So, but it's about that Vancouver um, was uh, the the social economy. The philosophical economy was always guided by the Christian ethos, right? And it's similar to the uh, monument for East Vancouver, the East Van Cross, it's the Christian ethos. So when people say, well, try to defend me by saying it's not really a Christian cross, I always say it is a Christian cross, right? But then they say, that, that surprises me. I didn't know you were a Christian. I said, it's not about me being a Christian. It's about the Christian ethos being the predominant and, you know, even oppressive um, uh, terms by which we experience uh, uh, social life. And so the, the, the four colors uh, come from that song, which was a song that's very commonly sung by Canadian school children. Uh, I had to learn it when I was a kid, um, when I was very young, it was very popular. It, and it, it has a bit of a troubling beginning because it started as a, um, American Civil War song, but the tune became readapted and, and the uh, lyrics became, um, uh, was rewritten as a children's Christian song. Great, thank you. Okay, we have uh, one more question from the Shogi. This time it's a question. So I guess it's for Colin. Do you think of the concept of Mori as four dimensions, bracket, space and time, bracket? Then we use this as a lens to consider the rich works of Ken, for instance. Right. Yeah, uh, yeah, I definitely think there's an aspect of space and time involved. Um, part of what intrigued me about these concepts of moire and even this notion of the catwalk is that in order to see things differently or gain new perspectives, we also we, we need to shift our positions. Uh, so I think I got into some of that in terms of the theory with the uh, reading I did from a graphic, a kind of graphic unconscious. And this idea of, of changing perspective also requires us to change, to change, to shift, to see things at a different angle. And by shifting our perspective, we see uh, various complexities of places and histories, et cetera, um, and, and things that may be hidden behind it or around it or on the other side of it start to reveal themselves. And, and that offers more information from which we can, um, you know, yeah start asking questions and, and, and um, complexifying how we, how we know things or see things and understand things. Okay, great. Um, well, we have time for one more question, if anyone has one. 
Otherwise, I think, uh, um, Lucia, do you want to post all the links? And I think in the chat box, and uh, we are going to post the links and uh, for our future events and in the context of online and uh, the links for you to register for the um, webinar series we have for next week and also how to um, register for the competition and um, also how where to download where where to download Mori um, and actually in conclusion um, first of all thank everyone thanks Colleen thanks the artist and who helped uh, produce this project and make it happen and thanks so much Ken for being here not only being to to support us and also participate at Q&A and in closing actually I would like to read one quote from the interview Ella had with Ken in Maury on the subject of imagination um, I think it resonates with today's events and uh, the spirit of our online initiative so to quote what role does the imagination play in terms of knowledge production? Without the capacity to imagine, there would be no human development. All experiences rooted in the imagination in the sense that we draw lessons from what we experience in terms of what we felt and sensed and what we imagine to be otherwise of what was experienced. The imagination is in everything we are as humans. So thanks again and for joining us. And uh, well, hope to see you again in our future events. <laughs> thank thank you. you so much. Greatly appreciated. Okay, thanks everyone. Bye.